In July 1989, nuclear physicist Tom Cochran found himself in an unlikely scenario. For me, it was overwhelming, I would say. Tom was in the Soviet Union with a group of American congressmen and a couple of reporters from the New York Times and the Washington Post. They had spent the day visiting one of the main sites where the Soviets produced plutonium for their stockpile of 30,000 odd nuclear weapons. It was also the site of what was the world's worst nuclear accident before Chernobyl. We had a very interesting tour. You know, the people were seeing Americans for the first time. Interesting is an almost laughable understatement. The Cold War wasn't over yet. This was an unprecedented look inside a Soviet nuclear facility. And to the group's surprise, after they walked through the facility, they got on a boat. Well, many of the lakes there are heavily contaminated, but if you went upstream, there was a lake that wasn't contaminated. And it was that lake that they were headed to, because the Soviets, they had something planned. They had set up a picnic on an island. It was there, on an island, in the less contaminated Lake Ertiash, that this unlikely group sat down to eat, having just visited a place no one thought foreigners would ever see. There was a stand of birch trees, a long table, place settings, white linen, lots of food, and Tom, idly chatting with his companions about the plutonium production site they had just toured. It was summer, it was warm, the mood was celebratory. The head of that laboratory was a 86-year-old gentleman. Our fact checker says he was only 73, but I'm sure to a much younger Tom, he seemed quite old. He took off all his clothes, jumped in the lake, went swimming, and a couple of us did the same. But the congressman kept their clothes on because the reporters were there. (laughs) And that's how Tom found himself skinny dipping with the number one enemy of the United States, only days after conducting a nuclear experiment that everybody had thought was impossible. 95% of the time you're doing your day job, but spend 5% of the time try to figure out how to change the world. And most of those, nine out of 10 of them are not gonna work. But if you can hit on one of them, it works. This episode, a group of scientists hatch a plan to board a Soviet warship with a nuclear weapons detector to show the U.S. government that it can be done. The Black Sea Experiment. That I've signed legislation that will outlaw Russia forever. (laughs) We begin bombing in five minutes. The Iran deal is a disaster. They're testing missiles. And what is that all about? You know, I wish we'd have found weapons of mass destruction. The maxim is dovayai no provayai. Trust, but verify. (laughs) You repeat that at every meeting. (laughs) In the 1980s, the idea of a nuclear war was ever-present in our culture. When I was eight, I asked my dad, what would happen if the Russians nuked the factory he worked at? Would we all die? He told me no, and that was the first time I realized he was capable of lying to me. During the past decade and a half, the Soviets have built up a massive arsenal of new strategic nuclear weapons, weapons that can strike directly at the United States. The Cold War was ramping up, and it showed no signs of abating. Because the U.S. government and the Soviet government were not working with each other. Instead, they were in a game of nuclear chicken. 
uh, Reagan brought in with him the view that, that the Soviet Union thought it could fight and win a nuclear war. Therefore, we have to posture ourselves so we can fight a nuclear war. This is Frank von Hippel. He's also a physicist. Frank was at that picnic with Tom on Lake Ertiash. I don't know if he's skinny dipped, and I don't know if I want to know. I, d- I think um, probably an assistant secretary of defense who started saying, you know, we, you can survive. All you need is a shovel. Dig a hole and, 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 and I don't know, cover it with boards and with some dirt, and, and you can survive the, the radioactive fallout from a, a, a nuclear war. It was the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. And the original quote is even worse than that. But just believe me when I say a shovel and some boards are not going to get you out of this. Reagan called the Soviet Union an evil empire. He joked about bombing the Soviet Union out of existence. Well, Russia forever. <laughs> we begin bombing in five minutes. Both countries were building more and more and more nuclear weapons. And also talking openly about the prospect of a nuclear war, which made it all the more exciting that a group of American scientists would soon receive an invitation to meet with the Soviet Academy of Sciences in Moscow. In Moscow, the image was that the U.S. was controlled by a military industrial complex. At the time, Frank was the head of the Federation of American Scientists. It sounded good. In a way, I was being used to uh, give credibility. The name Federation of American Scientists is actually a bit grandiose for what it is. The Soviet Union had the Academy of Sciences, which literally controlled Soviet science. The Federation of American Scientists, on the other hand, is more of a lobbying group or interest group. American scientists were afraid of where things were headed, and he intended to do something about it. Frank accepted the invitation to Moscow. And we met. What they called themselves was the uh, Committee of Soviet Scientists for Peace and Against the Nuclear Threat. The chairman was Evgeny Velikov, who was a vice president of the Academy of Sciences. And we only learned two years later he was an advisor of Gorbachev. Frank may not have known it at the time, but Evgeny Velikov would change his life. Velikov and Frank decided that maybe they could work together and figure out some way to make a difference in the Cold War. Over the next few years, they would keep meeting to brainstorm. They had to bide their time and wait for the right moment to act. In the meantime, though, they started what would become a lifelong friendship. They visited Washington, had the meeting with Kennedy, and Velikov had a very heavy suitcase. It turned out that that uh, Teddy Kennedy had given him a bust of John Kennedy. And then we took Belikov to The Right Stuff, which, is, which was playing in the theaters at the time, and uh, gave him a big, big bucket of popcorn, which kept him awake, I think. We all watched it with and, and had a good time. We are way out of line here. I'm out of line. Yes, sir. I'm running this show here. We'll see about that. Yeah. Frank and Velikov's budding friendship did not reflect where things stood between the U.S. and the Soviet Union at the time. Real diplomacy was dead in the water. The way the debate goes is, yes, yes, it would be great to end the nuclear arms race, but it's not feasible for technical reasons. You know, you can't verify it. I think I could sum up my own position on this with the recitation of a very brief uh, Russian proverb. Dovayai no provia. It means trust, but verify. Trust, but verify sounds great. But in practice, it was usually used as a cop-out. Like in 1985, when the new Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev said the Soviets would stop nuclear testing, at least for a time. The Americans refused to do the same because, as they said, it wasn't verifiable. And one of the things they said is, well, maybe they're still testing. How do, how do we know that they're not still testing? Maybe small tests that we can't detect. In other words, banging on about verification was really just an excuse for the U.S. to keep testing nuclear weapons because, according to the Reagan administration, it was impossible to verify whether the Soviets were keeping their word. At that time, the negotiations of the START Treaty were ongoing. 
START is the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. Strategic just means the really long-range missiles and bombers, the ones that can reach the U.S. from Russia and vice versa. There were tens of thousands of these weapons that the two sides would have used to fight a nuclear war. And one thing that the Soviets wanted to include in the START Treaty were sea-launched cruise missiles, nuclear-armed sea-launched cruise missiles. In the 80s, there were a lot of nuclear-armed cruise missiles, especially on U.S. ships and submarines. We call them sea-launched cruise missiles, or SLICMs for short. At one point, there was a proposal to ban all nuclear-armed SLICMs, a brand new technology that was accelerating the already pretty vigorous arms race. But Reagan disagreed, again saying there was no way to verify that the Soviets were complying. It's unclear if Reagan believed this, or if he just wasn't ready to make a deal with the Soviets. This was the kind of seemingly tiny detail that, along with a bunch of others like it, was holding up the entire START treaty. And the American objection was, you can't tell the difference between the nuclear-armed and a a non-nuclear-armed sea-launched cruise missile. We've got both of them, both types. The thing is, you can tell the difference. Frank and Velikov knew this. All they had to do was prove it. Enter Tom Cochran. We discussed several proposals, but one that was sort of at the top of the list was verification of the presence or absence of nuclear weapons on surface ships, because at the time, that was a a hot topic. Frank and Velikov and Tom had worked together before, proving that you could detect nuclear explosions. But verifying the presence of an undetonated nuclear weapon just sitting on a ship wouldn't be nearly as easy because you needed to be close to the weapon. And everyone assumed, unsurprisingly, that neither the United States or the Soviet Union would let a bunch of scientists onto their warships, certainly not the ones loaded with nuclear weapons. But if Frank and Tom could prove the Soviets were actually open to scientists boarding their warships, maybe they could pave the way for nuclear verification and nuclear arms control. And so then Tom uh, suggested to Velikov, well, why don't we do a demonstration? A demonstration aboard one of those warships to show it was possible. But Velikov was at the center of this and made everything happen. And he was a risk taker. He would make decisions even when he didn't have permission. (laughs) Velikov's proposal was unthinkable. Someone would have called you crazy if you had suggested that the Soviets were going to provide American scientists with access to one of their ships with nuclear weapons on it. Up to this point, the Reagan administration had bet that the Soviets would never agree to something like that. But Velikov had an in with Gorbachev. They just called Reagan's bluff. I'm not sure how many Americans have ever sat on top of a Soviet nuclear weapon. (laughs) But uh, I had no reservations or hesitations. I absolutely wanted to do this. Who wouldn't want to do that? It was uh, something that's never been done before. This is Steve Fetter. He's also a physicist. You can't swing a Schrodinger's cat in this podcast without hitting a physicist. 1989, I was uh, 29 years old. Steve was a professor of mine at the University of Maryland. When I asked him about this trip, he gave a very professorial answer. I really thought it might contribute. You know, the idea that I could play even a small part in leading to reductions in nuclear weapons, that's, that's a real powerful motivation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am sure Steve wanted to play a small part in reducing the danger of nuclear weapons. I also think 29-year-old Steve was psyched to go on a Soviet warship with the bomb. I'm wondering if you could talk to me a little bit about the preparations that led up to it. I Mm -hmm. presume you had to get the equipment. You had to get a visa. (laughs) I don't know how many pairs of clean underwear you planned to take. (laughs) Tom Cochran took charge of buying the equipment and procured a slug of depleted uranium for the testing. 
which we uh, brought up to Brookhaven. Tom put this slug of uranium about the size of a can of Coke, but it weighed 10 pounds. And he put it in a suitcase and he put, I think, rolls of toilet paper all around it so it wouldn't roll around. And uh, we flew up to LaGuardia and got a car and went to Brookhaven and checked out all of the equipment, made sure that we knew how to operate everything. And then flying back at LaGuardia, we look around and it, it looks like we're surrounded by the Port Authority Police Department. And they want to know, <laughs> who is Tom Cochran and what is that thing in the suitcase? You know, he explained it was a piece of uranium. <laughs> and he, of course, we were in compliance. We were carrying a permitted amount of radioactivity, but Tom had to take the train back <laughs> with his slug of uranium. We did not take the uranium to the Soviet Union. <laughs> they have plenty. <laughs> with the equipment all tested, the team departed for the Soviet Union with some members of Congress in tow. Congress doesn't deal with an issue until they've read about it in the front page of the newspaper. <laughs> but I realize if you bring some congressmen and you bring some reporters, you get front page coverage and people start paying attention. Appropriately, the Americans arrived in Moscow on the 4th of July, 1989. Did you bring gifts? I mean, I, I notice in all the pictures, you're wearing jeans and sunglasses. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then well, I was, uh, this has to, I mean, there's an enormous juxtaposition, right? In an era in which you like can't even get jeans in the Soviet Union. I mean, they're like a luxury good. And yeah. here you are rolling up all of 29 years old in jeans and sunglasses <laughs> and like, hey, dude. <laughs> In retrospect, I should have brought more gifts. I think Tom Cochran brought T-shirts. You might have seen a picture of me wearing a this red T-shirt with Black Sea Experiment on it. I think Tom brought a whole box full of shirts to give away. Did you save yours? I think I have it somewhere in a drawer. I'm not really a T-shirt wearing person normally, but... You're uh, not allowed to throw it out. I'm just telling you now. <laughs> yeah. As they prepared for the experiment, Tom got some surprising news. They came to me and said, you're only going to be allowed to take measurements for 10 minutes, which sort of shocked me in terms of getting useful data. The Soviets were worried that running the gamma detector for too long would reveal top secret information about how the warhead was made. In fact, top Soviet leaders had gotten wind of the experiment and attempted to stop it. The Hartan had opposed the idea and told Gorbachev not to do it, and then Gorbachev overruled him. So Velikov got it and got us a ship. He wasn't going to let anything get in the way of this experiment. I'm wondering if you could describe for me the actual experiment. So the Soviet Union supplied a ship the Slava, a guided missile cruiser. And they placed a sea launch cruise missile armed with a nuclear warhead in one of the tubes. And uh, they brought that into port near Yalta. So in our case, the main detector was this actually small thing, just um, a few inches in diameter. But it's very efficient. You can detect the distinctive fingerprints of plutonium or high enriched uranium that are emitted. They're very distinctive. To get an accurate reading, Steve had to get close to the bomb. Like, really close. We climbed up on top of the launch tube, right above the warhead, and put the detector there and recorded the radiation that was emitted. Now, we were only supposed to do it for 10 minutes. But I had been encouraged to keep on going as long as they would let us. We eventually took about 24 minutes of measurement. This was an unprecedented look inside a Soviet nuclear weapon. 24 minutes was more than enough to determine that there was a nuclear weapon on board. Perched precariously atop a nuclear warhead, Steve proved that verification was possible. 
Steve's technique worked very well if you were close to the bomb. But what about detecting it from further away? The Soviets conducted an even more practical test for that. They could see the neutrons come in off the plutonium in the warhead, flying by in a helicopter at about 70 meters away. It was very effective. The American scientists packed up their equipment and, a few days later, enjoyed that picnic on Lake Ertiash, followed by that celebratory skinny dip. The success of these experiments surprised no one in attendance. No one but maybe the members of Congress and their constituents who heard about it in the news. But then again, that's why those congressmen were invited. To see that the obstacles we were facing weren't technical, they were political. Although we call this an experiment, it was really a demonstration. There was really no doubt that you could detect a nuclear weapon, that you could verify that it was a nuclear weapon by identifying certain amounts of plutonium and high-enriched uranium. That was never in doubt. What was in doubt was the sincerity of the Soviet government having a new relationship with the United States. We published the Gamma Ray Spectrum in Science Magazine. To my knowledge, it is the only gamma ray spectrum of a nuclear warhead that's ever been openly published. Anyone can go on the internet now and find tons of information about how nuclear weapons are made, but not this level of detail. I cannot stress enough how insane it would be if a group of scientists were to publish something like this today. Not just the Black Sea experiment, but that whole era that we were living through, there was So much change happening, and it just seemed like so much was possible that had not been possible for a long time. So it really was a, you know, special moment in history. In the end, the START Treaty didn't limit Slickums like they'd hoped. The official position of the U.S. government remained that it was too hard. A few years later, though, after the breakup of the USSR, Washington and Moscow removed all nuclear-armed Slickums from their naval ships. Just not as part of a treaty. They decided to trust one another. Neither Navy really wanted inspectors with their gamma-ray detectors crawling all over their ships. And just like that, trust but verify gave way to something simpler. Trust. That ship in the Black Sea experiment remained in the Soviet and then the Russian Navy for decades. The Moskova, seen here in its prime, was Russia's Black Sea flagship. But it was destroyed by Ukrainian forces in April. Moscow is fighting back. The Moskva was the ship that the Ukrainians sunk last year. It was the same ship. And now, the symbol of Cold War cooperation is lying on the seafloor, another casualty of Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Things look pretty bleak with Russia right now. It seems impossible to imagine ever working constructively with them on anything again. We're enemies now. But we were enemies then, too. Ronald Reagan had called the Soviet Union an evil empire. But inside that empire, there were lots of people who weren't evil. They also wanted to change things, to build something different, something better. They were just waiting for their moment. You had to be in the right climate and da-da-da-da-da to make it all take some chances. And in my case, work with somebody like Velikov, who was willing to take chances on the other side and make decisions when he didn't have permission from the Politburo. He'd just do it. And he was my hero. An opportunity like the Black Sea experiment just doesn't come around very often. So when it does, it's nice to know that there are people like Frank and Velikov and Tom and Steve willing to take a chance. 
You need to be prepared to lose. You need to be prepared to spend a decade. You need to create coalitions because you can't do it by yourself. These issues are too big. Try to figure out how to change the world. Thanks for listening. I'm Jeffrey Lewis, and this is The Reason We're All Still Here. It's executive produced by me, Andy Chug, and Whitney Donaldson. Special thanks to the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey. This episode was produced by Kelsey Albright, Olivia Canny, and Stephen Wood. It was written by Kelsey Albright and me. Story editing from Sarah Joyner. Additional editing from Whitney Donaldson. Technical direction and engineering by Nick the Wizard Dooley. Music and sound design by Andy Chuck. Fact checking by Charles Richter. Additional production support from Gemma Castelli Foley. Show art by Ronan Wood and Anton Marinick. Special thanks to Jessica Varnum, Christina Ragassa, Megan Larson, and Maggie Taylor. 